Well, this is great because we've talked a lot about the crops, the water, but these all need conducive policies. I mean, we need to have a good policy environment also, not only to ensure that we don't have any further degradation of arable land into marginal land, but also to help encourage that investment, that policy environment for marginal lands. John, so what policies do you think need to be in place? Thank you. I think the concepts of resilience must be ingrained in us. Uh, it's very easy to want to do what you call the easy thing or the economic thing, or, but uh, we found that we do, things get worse as we go along. If we, by the, in 20 years, every vegetation or every crop is grown under protected, uh, in, in protected land, we'll be in, in, in serious trouble because it will just continue like that. For, I, I live in Djibouti, and for every, uh, I mean, it's so hot all the time. So the only way to live there is to use air conditioners. But I know that for every one degree centigrade, I cool down the environment inside. I create three degrees up on the outside. Mm -hmm. And this just continues. It will continue like this. Uh, unless we s start supporting marginal environments to, to recover uh, as a deliberate policy amongst uh, our, our, our formulations of, of development policies, we will just be uh, defeating ourselves. It will be only a matter of time, and our grandchildren will be the ones to take on the blame. So my proposal in terms of policy is that we should take uh, resilience seriously. For the time being, even as a safety net, we could continue to do the economic things as a temporary measure. But in, uh, at the same time, we invest also in making our systems recover. This, uh, this world of ours, this planet is sick. And it, we really need to pay a lot of attention to it. It's no longer the easy, the economic thing, the uh, capitalistic world of, of, of doing things is not necessarily the one. I've seen the Green Revolution and what it has done to us. Our dry, uh, our arid lands are huge expanses of wasteland. Nobody lives there. Because people want to do the easy thing, they want to go in places that are more productive. But those who stick it, I've shown that you can actually recover. A lot of these areas can recover. And, and so my, my proposal in terms of policy is that we should uh, make these environments do everything possible to uh, support the mm -hmm. marginal environments. Okay. Well, so we've seemed to have covered the gamut of socio-economic, political, and um, technological. Um, we'd like to open up to the audience now. Um, any comments, reactions to what's been said? Anything further that you'd like to add? Any questions to what they've actually, our panel's actually said? So um, open it up to anybody in the audience. Gentleman from Yemen would like to um, say something? Oh, you got the yeah. Yeah. Oh, my, sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah. my name is uh, Justice Liku and I work for K International. And I just want to pick on the successes which have been mentioned. One success was about, uh, I don't know whether it's Bangladesh, where there is a little irrigation, and they're growing crops off season, and they're able to export and make money. Okay? So the economic aspect is a driving factor. But I think the other one was mentioned about uh, marginal lands, where we have some horses of very productive things, mm -hmm. and I'm sure those things are finding market. Okay? I'm sure out of those two examples, it's not expensive. It, it should be manageable by those local people. Okay? And then the other aspect which you mentioned as success is focusing on the native crops. And you said if we focused on that, they can withstand the conditions. Okay? Most of the marginal lands also we mentioned, maybe most of the times we would say it's because of lack of water. But actually, the water which runs through those areas during the rain season. It's enough to sustain the success stories we are hearing. So I, I think basically, to me, I would look at it from the perspective of the economic perspective. If there was money to be made, the farmer would invest, and the farmer would do the right thing to make some money. So I would link it with some of the things we have been talking about. I think uh, you know the social behaviors and our mindset, OK? or now we can change things, I think we need to start with ourselves. Otherwise, I think there's huge, huge, you know, opportunity in marginal lands. As already mentioned, I think it produces the best quality food. Thank you.
Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, other questions, comments, <coughs> contrib contribution to the dialogue? Yep. <coughs> uh, but again, in the case of Yemen, Margin and lands in our country are mainly railway areas. And railway areas are very fragile in terms of rainfall, in terms of type of soils there, and uh, possibility of growing crops. We try to solve this problem by two, two directions, two dimensions. First of all, we try to introduce modern technologies to increase the value of the land, especially in terraces because greenhouse cultivation cannot be applied in our case in the coastal area, it requires cooling. While in the islands, we have a better potential for using marginal lands to construct a plant um, uh, greenhouses for cultivation of uh, vegetables like tomatoes, uh, cucumber, and lettuce, etc. We were faced with, first of all, problems in introducing the technology to these terraces. Although it appeared to be very successful in the beginning, we used rainwater harvesting for irrigation because we managed to make reservoirs to harvest water and then use reservoirs to as drip irrigation sources for our greenhouse. You know, so it was a successful uh, intervention. Uh, but there were several problems related to greenhouse cultivation, which uh, affected the speed of expansion of this school. Mainly, the, the incidence of infection with vegetables, with the recessed disease, and also uh, the fact that uh, environmental conditions sometimes affect the design of glasshouses because of wind, because of also water conditions, Plastic cover was not always durable. So that's one of the importance of trying to change the, the cropping systems into more uh, productive commercial or uh, crop oriented or uh, cash crop oriented uh, systems. The other uh, approach we applied in, in the marginal lands is the, 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 the efforts through ICBA to introduce um, new varieties that can cope with local environments in marginal lands and uh, examples of um, crops that had been mentioned by Dr. Ismahan was, I mean, are, are now subject to our research in the, the research agenda of our research system in Yemen with promising results. And we reach now a stage where we have uh, demonstration plots of these crops for, for dissemination among farmers. We reach a stage now where we work with local communities on, on how to utilize these crops in their diet food, uh, which is sometimes new to them. Uh, and there is scope for improvement in this regard. Thanks to ICBA uh, efforts uh, in this regional program we are now members in. Thank you. Yes, we have two questions here and here. Do you want us to respond as we go, Fiona? Or? Do you want to make a, I think we have some great comments if you feel, feel like. I, I think yeah. about, about mm. just the, the first yeah. comment about uh, the economics of it. So see, for example, in our intervention in the model farm, we had to change completely the irrigation system. We had to change the cropping system. And that was very heavy at the beginning. So having farms, farmers to accept to invest at the beginning and knowing that for the first and second year there is no return on investment, it's much more starting from the third or maybe longer term, it's very, very difficult. So most of them that are really looking at a short term, they are looking at a crop that within six months they can sell it and get it back. So that's why I think specifically for marginal environment there is a need for help and that's how we did it. We did it through the help of development agencies, for example. So when the examples goes, the same thing in Jordan or in Egypt, in other places. So economically, it is feasible after certain years. Depends, it's, it's, we can generalize. It depends on how marginal is that area, 
what the kind of water that you have, what the kind of cropping system that you could uh, that you get in it, but mostly it's very heavy for the first few years, and you need either a system or you need a co-op, you need different maybe interveners that could help get that farmers to wait for those few years to get the productivity back and the return on investment back. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we have a um, question here. Thanks. I'm Detlef Wurcher from the Global Hort, which is the Global Horticultural Initiative. Um, I would like to broaden up the perspective of the discussion and of marginal lands after all, and would like to introduce another, a different kind of cropping system. Um, for me, the question is whether land is only there for agricultural production, meaning why not using part of marginal areas for energy production through wind, through solar, etc., and combining that with agricultural production, meaning why not having high value crops only, which have a high efficiency in water usage, but then keeping like those commodities which you can buy somewhere else and store quite easily, meaning cereals for instance, why do you have to, or not you personally, but why, why should people produce cereals where actually the water is really so scarce that it is better used for high value crops and use the land for other production and earn money with that and with that money you can buy stuff. So broaden up the perspective of using marginal areas. Just agree with him completely. Thank you. Well, okay. maybe to add to that, um, actually there is a significant effort uh, to use marginal lands for biodiesel production. Uh, it's, I know it's different from what you're saying, but I just wanted to, uh, to put that forward. Uh, there is that debate taking place, especially in developed economies. Um, the the only thing I would add to that is the issue of food sovereignty that I mentioned earlier. Uh, say if you go to a place like Yemen and you say, we're going to buy our cereals by producing high value crops. If that capacity is not there or if it's not there on a timely basis, you have issues with food security in a way that you wouldn't have with other commodities. That's the only thing I would add. Of Yemen, yes. I mean, I don't. I I know Yemen a little bit. I went out of Sana a little bit, and I saw green fields, yeah. and these were high-value crops called cut, and they never ever produced their other kind of cereal. So they exactly did that already. <laughs> if I may, I uh, yeah, go team. You wanna go first? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think yeah, for some marginal environments, you need staple crops or you need like basic crops. So, because if we think about marginal environments that they don't have infrastructure, they don't have access to market, they don't have, so they need to, to just survive. It's much more for their own use as a community than for market. But I agree with you when in some levels of marginality, you can't use it for anything as a matter of fact, except maybe biofuels. And that's we, in ICBA we are working on a biofuel called Salicornia but that's a sea-based agriculture. It's a really the salinity that comes up to the level of the sea. And because there are very few, um, let's see, if you go on any coastal area, you would see a lot of things growing up. And most of them are biomass. And that's why we are looking at when it's extreme marginal, mostly coastal, you could have mangroves or if you could have salicornia that you can return on biofuels. So I agree with you, depends on the level of marginalities. The crops that you have to look at has to be the most economically viable, but you have to keep in mind the food security, the nutrition security, the sovereignty in some regions and for some particular com uh, communities. 